not tell you who wins the round, we will report it, and then uh, in the end you will know, I believe, after lunch, who advances. So now that we have the information. Okay. Um, we will begin the round with the affirmative. Each, the opening speaker has six minutes, followed by cross-examination. Um, in your other round, I'm not sure if you got the chance to address your cross-examination immediately or not or you have to wait to your rebuttal speech, probably. I'm asking. Oh, we did a cross-exam. You did a cross-exam, but then you had to wait for the rebuttal to respond. The, we did the, the, first, the first speech, speech. cross-exam, second speech, cross-exam, and then rebuttal, and then rebuttal. Okay, all right, so we'll probably follow similarly to, to what we did um, before. You are supposed to keep time for yourself or your partner, but I will stop you should your time exceed. So we'll go ahead and, and get started. Hello ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming today. Our 2015 resolution is whether NCAA college athletes should be compensated by making them pay university employees. I am on the affirmative. NCAA college athletes should be paid university employees. I'll be presenting four reasons why college athletes should be paid. One, practice is comparable to a job. Two, schools and communities benefit from college student athletes. Three, times have changed. And my last point is four, college students are being harmed. Practice is comparable to a job because these athletes have roles and responsibilities to fulfill. They put in time and effort and they expect an outcome. Just like if you were putting time into a job that would benefit an employer, students are due when they wanted to benefit their team and their coaches. According to Athletics Compliance Office at University of Notre Dame, in-season students practice four hours a day, 20 hours a week, and are in competition for three hours. Out-of-season student athletes may be required to participate in up to eight hours per week required strength and conditioning activities. This is during the academic year. Now these are countable hours. This does not include non-countable hours. Whereas athletes are traveling and they have to do training room activities in order to perfect their craft. When you work a job, you want to be compensated for the time and effort that you put in. Our next point is schools and communities benefit from student athletes, namely basketball and football players bringing in money to schools via concessions, ticket sales, and merchandise for games. When money changes hands to gain a profit, it becomes a business. We call the NCAA a nonprofit, but it's more of an enterprise. According to the Wall Street Journal, Median revenues at the top 120 NCAA Division I programs doubled to 56 million in 2012 from 2004. More than a dozen college sports programs gross over 100 million a year. College athletes generate attention, prestige, and interest for prospective students. The mission of NCAA is higher education, but that's incompatible with the idea that it's a revenue-based generating sport. The coaches are making money, so why can't the students? For instance, John Kalahari, the head basketball coach at the University of Kentucky, makes five and a half million a season. That's almost 14 times the amount made by the President of the United States. Under the pretext of amateurism, the NCAA prohibits college students from earning compensation tied to their performance. However, these are not amateurs, which are them, because the college students have been trained and conditioned for years. These athletes attract donors who then fund bigger stadiums, the greeters are paid, people who hand out flyers are paid, the people behind the ticket windows are paid, the security guards are paid, yet you don't pay the talent, entertainment, those who you came to watch. ESPN's preeminent college basketball analyst, Jay Vilas, who played for Center for Duke from 1982 to 1986, stated, NCAA is a multi-billion dollar business. It's professional in every way, except how athletes are treated. When you're profiting off of someone else, you're, while restricting them from getting a pro profit, that's exploitation. Students' names, jerseys, and likenesses have been used in video games without their permission, and they have not received compensation. They have also been used in broadcasts and commercials, which is how the NCAA gener 
generates a lot of its funds. U.S. District Judge Wilkin in the Ed O'Bannon case agrees. Wilkin imposed a legal injunction that if current or former Division I men's basketball and FBS football players' names, images, and likenesses should be awarded full grant aid up to the full cost of attendance for every year they are active as an athlete at the school. If they are not receiving profit from their images, then the money should be put in a trust for them when they graduate. As I mentioned before, the video games are using their images and likenesses like television broadcasts are arguably a substantial threat to the economic value of the athlete's performance should they go pro later on in life. My next point is times have changed. The NCAA has grown in size and number of sports teams. There's also greater promotion. In 2011, it was reported by ESPN that according to an NCAA budget release, 757 million through TV and marketing rights, fees, championship revenues, and other services were accrued. Paying athletes is not a new idea, and it has been debated for some time now. Peter Orr, director of National Labor Fred Relations Board, ruled that Northwestern's scholarship football players should be eligible to form a union based on a number of factors, including the time that they devote to the sport, the control by coaches, and their scholarships, which Mr. Orr deemed a contract for compensation. He also recognizes that students are often recruited for their athletics rather than academics. My next point is that, and going on, continuing with that idea, <coughs> is that, or the next point is, college students are being harmed. According to Fred Bowen from Washington Post, student athletes are already giving something valuable in reference to full ride scholarships. Yes, they benefit also from the livelihood they experience, but that's not enough. They're losing study time and hours that they could have otherwise worked. They also, it's also important to consider that not everyone gets a full ride or a full scholarship if they do receive one. Unexpected costs would be living expenses, rent, gas, and food. And there, some athletes also have to reduce their course load in order to maintain a good academic standing. The physical risks involve being harmed and when they receive injuries. Lack of compensation hurts athletes. I'm sorry. Thank you. And this is now your opportunity for cross-examination. to the 
the athletic department, but it doesn't, what happens to all the other, you know, 5,000, 40,000 undergrads that go to that school that maybe be tutors for those student athletes, they benefit as well from the athletic programs. So it doesn't benefit the whole school, it just benefits that specific athletic department. So are you saying that the student, are you strictly speaking about athletes? Or are you talking about students who are not athletes? Well, the money, like the money, like athletes already get so much money because that millions goes into their programs. So it's not right for them to be paid when they're already getting all these benefits. They're getting money trickled down to their department, helping them with other things, as in you're leaving out the whole rest of percentage of the school. That was a two-minute opportunity. I hope you got clarification on our last point. You are allowed to address that in your rebuttal um, or your final closing arguments from being a firm of the team. Okay. okay, so we can deal without that. Um, and now we will have the proposition's constructive argument. Hello, I'm going to be arguing in the opposition that the NCAA should in no way be paying their athletes. The three points that I will be discussing is that playing is a privilege, not a job and that athletes already receive enough aid that others don't, and that student athletes are not professional athletes. My first point discusses that the NCAA should not pay its players is because that playing a college sport is a privilege and not a job. Players were recruited and offered a spot on a team in exchange for an education. Athletes are receiving, an, are receiving a higher education at universities and colleges that thousands of of Americans cannot attend. More so, they're getting it on the dime of the university. Players are being paid to be student athletes through scholarships that are awarded in correlation with a player's talent and that are determined by the coaching staff. In addition to a higher education, players learn values that go beyond the classroom and will be translated into the workforce once out of school. It's estimated that an athlete receives about $125,000 worth in training and academic scholarship. College athletes should be grateful that they have a chance to play in college, that they were able to attain something that so many people would want. Paying athletes would reduce it to a mediocre chore and would diminish the love of the game. When you are in school, your job is to be a student. It's the reason why student athletes comes first in the phrase student athletes. My second point is that student athletes are compensated fairly. As I mentioned earlier, the college uh, athletes go to school on the university's dime. And for those athletes that attend Division III schools, coaches set up deals to get them undeserved academic scholarships because the NCAA does not allow for the Division III schools to give athletic scholarships. This takes away from the students that have a 3.5 or 4.0 that desperately need a scholarship to continue their education because Division III schools tend to be private institutions that have higher tuition. During the 1993 uh, and 94 academic year, the university awarded $4 million to its 500 student athletes, but only $400,000 in merit scholarships to the remaining 5,900 5, students. Similarly, University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill offered $3.2 million for 690 student athletes and a measly six. 136,000 for the remaining 15,000 undergraduate students. That comes out to be a whopping $42 a student divided equally among the 15,000. Something is grossly skewed here, and the NCAA paying its student athletes will only add fuel to the fire. My third and final point is that student athletes are not professional athletes. Student athletes are amateurs who choose to participate in intercollegiate athletics athletics as part of their educational experience. Students are not professional athletes who are paid salaries and incentives for, for career in sports. They are students receiving access to a college education through their participation in sports, for which they earn scholarships to pay tuition 
fees in room and board, and other allowable expenses, such as a few books. Collegiate athletes, collegiate sports is not a career or profession. Sports are just the student's way to getting a higher education. The NCAA and its member schools encourage high academic standards and have a commitment to having players succeed, since its, its goal is an educational mission. And that's the reason why it's tax exempt. The NCAA provides services to athletes in case they are injured, such as an injury insurance that provides a $10 million a year fund for special needs in case players are injured. Another reason why they're not professional athletes is because they have an amateur status. Um, in fact, the majority of athletes in the NCAA conferences are not superstars bringing in million dollars for the university. If they were professionals, they'd be making millions anyway. Um, and in fact, the vast majority of NCAA athletes um, in, are in non-revenue generating sports. These athletes generate negative incomes for their schools. Um, Dr. Andrew Zimbalas, a professor at Smith College, says students who receive full-ride scholarships in the non-revenue sports, such as swimming, volleyball, soccer, tennis, etc., receive a very hands handsome remuneration for their services given that their sports generate very little, if any, revenue for their schools. These student athletes are the real beneficiaries of intercollegiate sports. Furthermore, in 2009, only 14 NCAA schools turned out a profit. These co colleges are not professional institutions. They're not making any money. In the colleges that do make money, there's only 14 of them compared to the other 200 that are in the NCAA. Um, they don't have the capital to pay their athletes a salary on top of the academic compensation they already pay. This is why the NCAA should not pay their athletes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you are welcome to cross examine. Um, you said it's a privilege, not a job. You said it's a privilege to be a but I feel so it's a contradiction because, again, you go to a school where the main priority is education, and you have all these activities that you promote for, for kids, for students, to be a part of, and they have to put so much work into it that they can't focus on it. Are you getting paid to be here right now? Am I getting paid to be a student? No, are you getting paid to be in this debate right now? No. Right, this is an extracurricular activity. This is, like, this is enhancing your experience right now as a student. This is going to give you valuable life experience. This is going to prepare you for the real world. Educational wise, but you don't think that having leadership skills that sports will give you, being a captain on a sports team is going to give you lots of valuable leadership experience. Let's try to practice. You can turn table. Let him finish his sentence. <laughs> I mean, I know you want to get to it, but let him finish his sentence. But. Okay, maybe it does uh, leadership, but educational wise, I mean, come on, it's, they're they're out there playing football when in reality they're missing time to their education, especially you know when they make it to the finals and they have to leave school and go to this big stadium and play in front of all these people and they're losing all this time for school. I feel like it's a big contradiction because you tell the students one thing about education is important, yet they have to put all this time into football and their their education is lost. Yes, they build leadership qualities. But that doesn't help them with their GPA. It helps them with the football. Well, I mean, if you're in any extra clicker activity, you're missing days here and there. I mean, a football season is one season. That's two months. I missed three days this week because I had extra clicker activities. I was in the Capitol Tuesday. I missed today. You have to balance your schedule. Do you actually think you could balance your schedule between putting 20 hours a day into football? Well, rather, you rather than this, because this is a very, this is a very different scale. I did three days in high school for field hockey. That's high school, though. You could fly by high for, school. For a free education, I am willing to put the work and effort in. Those would be the last comments for the uh, cross-examination period, and now we will have closing arguments from the front.
difference between a professional athlete and another and an amateur athlete is a contract, honestly. Um, some students aren't going to receive scholarship money, so that will, they will have to pay out of pocket. So yeah, they will receive some benefits, but only benefit they receive is growing board education, whereas if they're being used or exploited to make money or to have revenue come in, they're not being compensated. Um, it's not harder to pay student athletes, especially since schools have the power to choose what they want to pay. Um, there's all this conflict that playing af paying athletes violates NCAA rules. Just change the rules, honestly. Let the schools pay what they want. Um, according, to the ES according to ESPN, Title IX does not require identical spending on men and women's sports. And the reason why I bring this up is because women's sports is not really talked about. Um, it's supposed to be equal, however, in practice, this does not happen on time. All 73 schools in BC, BCSAQ conferences, including seven non-football schools, spend more on men's sports teams than women's sports teams. Title IX does not ensure that every dollar spent on men is matched by a dollar spent on this. Now, how are they being compensated fairly? Yes, they get school tuition or they get all that stuff for free if they're they win a scholarship by chance if they were to win a scholarship. However, the NCAA makes money, money off of these students. Okay. Now, according to the Indiana Law Review, one example that was referred dealing with the NFL Players Association, players hereby grants to club and league the right and authority to use his name, nickname, initials, likeness, image, picture, photograph, animation, persona, autograph, signature, his voice, biographical information and or any and all other relenting uh, characteristics which is collectively and publicity rights. It's the same thing that the NCAA do to these students.